we're recording. So I put in my new title on here. I'm Charles James, Executive Director of Rural Advantage ACO, in addition to my 30 years with North American. And we're here today to talk about uh, annual wellness visit billing for RHCs. Got a little different controls here. So where I mess things up, just bear with me if you don't mind. Annual wellness visits for RHCs. When we start, first started this endeavor of Rural Advantage and started talking about annual wellness visits and looking at potential participants and then folks like you that signed up, we looked at their patient attribution and your annual wellness visits and we had big goose eggs under annual wellness visits and people were incredulous. They, we do hundreds of annual wellness visits. How do we have no annual wellness visits attributed to us? So my premise was, and this is supported by the chart evaluations that we did was that we just weren't reporting our quality I put quality visits on the slide are preventive services correctly to Medicare. And largely what was driving us to not report those correctly was this whole concept of which line item do we get paid for when we do an annual wellness visit with a sick visit. And that question I think has warped the whole, not only conversation, but the whole practice of how RHCs are reporting and whether they are reporting annual wellness visits in a manner that they'll get correctly attributed to that reporting provider with Medicare coordination of benefits receives the annual wellness visit and can record it in the system. And the reason many were getting goose eggs were because that wasn't happening and indeed of this of I reviewed 10 different participants so far and only one of them were getting their annual wellness visits reported correctly and even there there was a slight mistake on it even though it didn't affect how the claim was adjudicated so most of us know and we have to forgive me G0438 G0439 I tend to conflate annual wellness visit and subsequent annual wellness visit when we're talking about them. And I usually say annual wellness visits. There's a slight difference, of course, with subsequent annual wellness visits. Those are recurring. The annual wellness visit is technically a once per lifetime because everything else are, we get the welcome to Medicare visit. We get an annual wellness visit after 12 months of eligibility and not within 12 months of the welcome to Medicare visit. And it is, it's once per lifetime. So I had hoped to pull up a website. I'll see if I can do that while we're recording. I'm not sure if it will let me. And let me see. Yes, I do. Can you all see my screen with the CFR of the annual wellness visit? Great. Yes. So this is, you know, just like we have the Rural Health Clinic, right? Of course, we have a CFR for an annual wellness visit and all of its components, including the personalized prevention plan and conditions for coverage. So we get some of these definitions up top here when we look at the CFR. And then we get down to what needs to be in the annual wellness visit. I'm not going to read through these. I'll let you have this as a reference. But of course, our templates should be designed to capture these things. The one thing I do want to point out right here is look here at the top. A big part of this is the health risk assessment that we're required to do for the patient. I just said I'm not going to read these. I'm going to read a few of them. 
In addition to the individual's medical and family history, we need a list of current providers regularly involved in care. Hey, I've got an uh, oncologist or whomever I'm dealing with down the line. The reason I point out the risk assessment is that is a component that does not have to be provider performed. Many of these components and particularly with the subsequent annual wellness visits in the regular world in a non rural health clinic world, a nurse can perform a subsequent annual wellness visit and a provider get paid the line item. Since we're a rural health clinic, we know that that works differently. So I want to put an asterisk on the health risk assessment while we point out that the required components of the annual wellness visit are right here in CFR 410.15. That is referenced in the presentation that we're doing. And it's linked here at the top so that when you get these slides, got that link. So those were the, by statute, by reg, the components of the annual wellness visit. If we bring it back to rural health clinics and figure out how does this work with our rural health clinics, since most of us, our primary care settings are rural health clinics. So we're having to navigate how to properly build these and engage our providers to report them. Why will it be important to our providers? And of course, as we all point out, patient compliance, big issue. I want to come back over to this risk assessment. If we look at this risk assessment, one thing I said was, uh, where did the risk assessment go? Right here. It could be nurse performed. That can be patient performed. I have a check, a uh, screening form. I think, Tanya, I've sent it to you that if you send out, and I am the biggest anti-paper person there is, but for our Medicare patients, I think it would be beneficial to even think about sending out the patient, the health questionnaire that would cover this health risk assessment. And if that gets brought back in, we can scan it. Maybe the nurse, nurse enters it. We can talk about how that gets into the record. But that health risk assessment is about half of the annual wellness visit by time. It's about half. And that can be patient reported, nurse performed. So this is where we're gonna, we utilize our non-provider staff to help do these. It doesn't have to be the provider doing the whole visit. If we get good at these, an annual wellness visit should take all told about 30 minutes. Well, our providers don't have an extra 30 minutes. So if we're working in tandem with our nursing staff and our, you all are RNs on here. Uh, so that's how to split up the labor to get these done. So it's not just adding a significant more burden on our provider to get through a relatively lengthy visit. 30 minutes, if we don't have muscle memory on them, all told, it could be 30 to 45 minutes, depending. 30 would be a, a fast provider accustomed to doing those. Now, here's the big thing to point out as a rural health clinic. These are standalone visits. Standalone visits. If a standalone visit is furnished on the same day as another medical visit or another standalone visit, it's not a separately payable encounter. We can report it. This is our fundamental flaw in how we understand annual wellness visits in a rural health clinic. Because when 98% of us get to this statement, this is directly out of the Medicare Benefit Policy Manual, the furnished on the same day as another medical visit or in brackets, another standalone encounter. It's not a separately payable encounter. That doesn't mean it's not reportable. We can put it on the claim. It's just not going to get encounter treatment. But here's the thing. When you post it, think about this. When it gets posted to the system, the way the system works, then 
there's going to be an RVU value associated with what gets posted to the system. Where, of course, if we focus on, oh, well, the annual wellness visit is not payable in this context, they're here for a clinic visit or vice versa, let's say the patient, uh, you know, oh, we decide, well, we'll do, the annual wellness, we'll do the annual wellness visit today and come back for the sick visit. That's actually kind of reversed. We should do the sick visit, treat, them, treat the sickness, and then and we're going to talk about that momentarily. But because we confuse payable with reportable, that's what leads so many to do it wrong. I'm going to show a claim example here. Remember, part of the reason we need to report this correctly, get it on the claim correctly, is because we can't have coinsurance and deductible applied to preventive line items. I want to bring up advanced care planning. I also want to point out when we get to this point, another tool that I use extensively is uh, I like to just Google the Medicare Preventive Service quick reference chart. There's a link to this chart. If we come here to annual wellness visit, of course, you'll have already noticed we have sections here for all of the preventive screenings. When we come here to annual wellness visit, we come down and, and Medicare tells us all of the parameters. And this is universal. This is not just for rural health clinics, but this is also for RHCs and FQHCs. And look what it says on advanced care planning. Medicare is encouraging us to provide advanced care planning. If we think about it from a shared savings perspective, what do we know about the amount of cost that Medicare beneficiaries incur at end of life? We know it's significant. So when we demonstrate advanced care planning, we have a better idea of what the patient wants. I hate to put it in these terms. That's going to represent savings to the Medicare program. So this is a big measure to get. If we can get it on our annual wellness visits, what we're going to do and what Medicare instructs us to do is, even though I don't think the modifier would means anything in this instance, Medicare tells us to use it, so we will. We can put advanced care planning as a component of the annual wellness visit. We're going to report those at the same time. So you don't have to do advanced care planning at the time of the annual wellness visit, but boy, let's encourage everyone to do so. And I'm going to point out what a, a big incentive to do that will be. It's got to be delivered on the same day as the annual wellness visit uh, by the same annual wellness visit provider to do this. Of course, we know this, uh, excuse me, I want to go back one slide and it's not, I'm not going to be able to because we're recording this, but advanced care planning is a standalone encounter. It's a standalone encounter. So if it's rendered with the annual wellness visit, it's just for information, but important information for us. If it's by itself, it would be an encounter. Oh, so you mean if I ask my patient to come back tomorrow and we can talk, hey, let's get through where you're really sick here. We've got four or five chronic conditions we need to treat. Let's do your annual wellness visit and let's come back and let's talk about advanced care planning and what you want to do you know, for end of life planning uh, next Thursday. And then next Thursday, it's a standalone encounter. That's another encounter. Now, the big thing is when patients present is not a routine visit. You all on this call know this. Is not a routine visit. Routine is going to be indicated by a V700.00 largely diagnosis code. There's some other variations of that. And we also know that there are some 9938 and 39 codes. Medicare doesn't recognize those codes. Annual wellness visit is our wellness visit. It's not a routine physical. Routine physical is a FAA physical, a CDL, that's a routine physical, or coming in, a lot of our providers, 
miscode. A lot of our patients misunderstand and say, I'm coming in for a routine physical. Uh-uh. Don't let that become part of the chief complaint. We're not here for a routine physical. Annual wellness visit. Or known chronic conditions, of course, but banish routine physical from our conversation for Medicare patients. Now, everything I'm saying here with annual wellness visits should apply to your Medicare Advantage plans. For annual wellness visits, I will encourage you, bill annual wellness visit for all Medicare payers. We're here today to talk about how to get it on a real health clinic claim, but don't just focus on annual wellness visits for traditional Medicare. There's money to be made, just as much money, probably more, on our Medicare Advantage plans and reporting these measures, all of our preventive services measures, especially our annual wellness visits. Medicare Advantage plans that don't pay you like a rural health clinic, they're gonna pay this extra annual wellness visit line. I don't have all this other encounter, standalone encounter stuff to deal with if they're not paying. If they're just paying you fee for service, bill your annual wellness, subsequent annual wellness visits, all your preventive services to your Medicare Advantage patients all day, every day. Big revenue boost there. Now, of course, we're not focusing a lot on the IPPE here. Again, it's a once in a lifetime event. That is a same day bill on the Welcome to Medicare. So automatically on Welcome to Medicare, sick visit and Welcome to Medicare on the same day if the patient's eligible for it, within 12 months of Medicare eligibility, Welcome to Medicare once in a lifetime. After 12 months, if they haven't had a Welcome to Medicare visit, it's only gonna be an annual wellness visit. No longer eligible for a Welcome to Medicare visit. That's the same day claim. We don't have the same standalone encounter conversation. I am here to ask all, everyone, not just us on this call, not just Rural Advantage participants, not just North American Healthcare Management Service billing clients, but the entire rural health clinic community and FQHC community to completely reverse how we think about providing annual wellness visits and sick visits at the same time. Patients come in, they want the annual wellness visit because they know there's no coinsurance, but they're sick. Rare is our patient that has two chronic conditions. That's a healthy patient. And anybody with two or more chronic conditions automatically 214 if they present with something else. So first of all, there are no more 213s with our patients with multiple chronic conditions, A. B, if they come in with multiple chronic conditions, it's impossible, and especially if some of those are untreated, it's impossible to perform an annual wellness visit, right? Because the patient's not well. Medical judgment and patient needs prevail in this question. I am an MBA guy. I'm not a clinical person. I cannot tell a doctor when to treat a patient, nor would I want to or try. Patient needs, medical judgment comes first, but Medicare does not allow us, by definition, most of our patients have transportation security problems, and we cannot have a policy of making a patient return. Note, I said we can't have a policy of having a patient return. That means it's not something I would put in writing. If you have a Medicare, if you have a provider that routinely has the patient retur return, that's a different question. But as uh, an RHC owner, manager, or part of an institutional provider like you all, you don't want to write down we don't want our patients to have to come back. Medicare, the one time I tell the story that I didn't get pulled off a of stage, but I had a CMS regional office person, really seriously, give me a finger wag. You do not, this is when annual wellness visits first came out. 
you do not tell the patient to come back. You treat the patient while they're there. And I said, yes, ma'am. How many times, what for and how to. And the point is it can't be a policy. If, hey, this patient is sick and I cannot do the annual wellness visit today, that's a different question. But the patient just presenting for an annual wellness visit doesn't automatically mean anything, especially if they're sick. We've got a place for medical decision-making. We just can't have the policy. So again, annual wellness visits, standalone encounters, same day as another standalone encounter or sick visit, we just get one AIR. We're trying to push this in Congress or change this in Congress to where just like the rest of the world, we get the extra line item. But that's a congressional push and we see as of today what's happening in Congress and looks like it could be a slim two years for getting things passed. But regardless, right now, annual wellness visit, standalone encounter, just because it's not separately payable doesn't mean to not report it. Or conversely, of course, just because it's not separately payable, it should please, please, I beg you, be reported. This is what's going to make the difference for all of our Rural Advantage participants. Any of you others that may listen to this video participating in a value-based, uh, uh, an accountable care organization or other value-based care program, this is the key to your participation. Get the annual wellness visits on the claim regardless of the fact that it's not a separate AIR should be reported on the claim. I can't re-emphasize it enough. Oh, why would providers care? Sorry to put it in these terms, but yes, especially in organizations that are providers are uh, some, if not 100% RVU, let's take a look at the RVUs. Look at 99213, it has a one over here on the right, we have our office visit RVUs, and on the left we have our preventive service RVUs. Wow. Am I right that a G0439 has the same RVU as a 99214? I most certainly am. Look at that, and at annual wellness visits 2.6. Nice. So when we defer, so let's face the fact too with the annual wellness visit and the sick visit on the same day. You think you're going to get the patient back for the annual wellness visit? 50-50. It's kind of like the patient statement. If you don't collect the money at the window and it walks out the door, you have immediately a 75% reduced chance of getting that money for that day's encounter. I, I'll give it same odds on an annual wellness visit, getting the patient back for an annual wellness visit. So uh, when the patient's there, of course, our primary concern is the patient need, but also let's face fact, if the patient walks out, there's less likelihood we're going to get them back for the annual wellness visit. We're affecting the patient's care negatively. We're affecting our Medicare shared savings rate negatively, and we're foregoing the opportunity for an equivalent RVU. Look at that, equivalent RVU. We could double the RVU for that encounter. Now, your employer, your hospital may not get paid for that encounter, but I'm here to tell you, sorry, hospital, don't care. The incremental RVUs and the incremental value-based measure is much more valuable to us than the extra encounter. When you start affecting RVUs like this across the board, that's going to raise all ships, regardless of how the encounter may pay. So here's our provider incentive right there. Let's look at some, one more point I wanted to make. Forget what you know about modifier 25. We're not going to use modifier 25 the same way on an office visit and an annual wellness visit in the Royal Health Clinic. Forget it. I see a lot of providers that if I have an office visit and an injection, I'll put a modifier 25 on it. 
if I have a if I have an office visit and anything else, I just audit, modifier 25 is the most overused modifier that we have. So our second reason we go awry in incorrect annual wellness visit reporting is many of us insist on putting modifier 25 somewhere on the claim and it doesn't need to be. Not on a traditional Medicare claim, rural health clinic claim. If a, a Medicare Advantage, what I said about a Medicare Advantage plan that pays you like a commercial plan, pays you fee for service on a 1500, modifier 25 would be applicable to that fee for service reimbursement, most likely. For our traditional UBO4 Medicare claims, this is what applies. Modifier 25 is a separate encounter. Patient leaves and comes back. It's not the same thing as in the fee-for-service world where we tack it onto evaluation management. So forget about your 25 modifier on annual wellness visits. I'll let this sink in for a second. Take a sip, sip of coffee. I hope, hope all of you can taste it. The CG modifier is always going to go on the sick visit when there is a sick visit and annual wellness visit performed on the same day. Medicare will pay. So let's say we put the CG modifier on the annual wellness visit. In, th in my view, in theory, this statement that's on the RHC reporting FAQ, modifier CG report only on medical service, I believe is incorrect. <laughs> Easy for me to say, I'm not the person, I'm not Medicare. CG, in my view, should be the primary reason for the visit. So you could put this on, on the annual wellness visit here. In that case, we'd only get one encounter payment that would have no coinsurance. So it's like the 214 would go away. I have to give you the Medicare line, even though I know a CG modifier on that second line would pay, but only one CG modifier. But regardless, our formal official guidance is CG modifier goes on the sick visit. Doesn't matter what they showed up for, according to current CMS guidance, even though in practice, some of the max adjudicate the claims a little differently than what this says. I know that you will find that shocking. So for this one, I went ahead and I put the advanced care planning with the 33 modifier on there. Now, here's the other thing that when we start talking about any of these services like this, I'm going to go one more here. Ooh, look at that. I should have put the 33 modifier on that. We're going to get one encounter payment out of this. But look at our RVUs on this. 6.02 RVUs. That advanced care planning uh was obviously somewhere just under two rvus i think uh if we go 192 this 192 for the 214 i think it's 2.6 for the g0438 and so whatever the math that leaves us there's a nice rvu pickup on the advanced care planning and oh by the way very important shared savings indicator so I would encourage as many claims like this as we can. Forget uh, medical director. I'm, I'm going to avoid using names here. Your medical director, our audience on this particular recording, did not like me saying forget about the second payment. I, I, I wonder if she was not I'm not sure what, what it, a lot of providers don't like to hear that. <laughs> don't, don't worry about the second payment, but we have to forget about it. We got to worry about getting all of these on. If a provider is paid via RVU incentive, this is a nice, I mean, this is, shows a nice RVU pickup for any provider, as well as just accomplishing a lot of different goals here. I think I have a duplicate claim on this one. I probably meant to just eliminate that. Here is a good view of 
the preventive service chart that I mentioned. I encourage everyone to go look into these, be familiar with them. Boy, just with the same annual wellness visit conversation with, does this result in an encounter? We need to think about how our nurses fit in. Hey, I've already seen the patient for that 99214. So at that point, and this patient's due for their subsequent annual wellness visit, at that point, I could have, we could have the nurse do the whole subsequent annual wellness visit. I'm already not anticipating getting paid in encounter. So in this instance, have the nurse finish it out. We're not going after the extra encounter. If we want to get the extra encounter, even though we already won't, there's a clinical visit. It's a standalone encounter. In order to get the encounter, the nurse can do, for example, the health risk assessment. The big part of annual wellness is to include personalized care plan and health risk assessment. The health risk assessment can be a patient performed questionnaire or the nurse entering it into the EMR side by side by the patient. It doesn't have to be that. It'll be the patient perform questionnaire. Then the provider in order to bill it, let's say the patient, the nurse does the health risk assessment, does some of the history, kind of same way we would think about prepping a patient for a clinical visit. And then the provider comes in to approve the care plan, perform a final patient evaluation, patient instructions, and sign off on the encounter. And then that's a payable rural health clinic visit. So that's the way to split up the work in my view. I don't know that we're doing a lot of the telephone only, but you all, we had a conversation about reaching out to homebound patients. For other listeners, folks we're talking to are in Appalachia. If you're a homebound patient, there's a high likelihood you don't have great cell service or internet access. So telephone only, even though you may not have great cell service, becomes essential. We can do annual wellness visits absolutely via GT025 and telehealth, telephone only. We can do those. Telephone only is going to remain after the public health emergency. If we didn't get telephone only back in the final row, we just got to have to check on that. We can provide telephone only and telehealth annual wellness visits, definitely. We have to get a CS modifier on it. We really, what I would prefer to have is G2025 is the telehealth claim. I'd prefer to have the G0438 as a zero charge with the preventive ICD-10 diagnosis code. And that way, that's for our purposes. Then we can mine that claim. If we don't put the detail on the claim as a zero charge, the only way we're ever going to know what was an annual wellness visit or what was a sick visit, we've got a CS modifier on it, uh, but would be to go to the patient's note. So that's where putting zero charges, we're going to have the same conversation on preventive CPT2 level codes and claims. It's our next topic. This is of course much more focused on annual wellness visits, but think about all of the same things I've talked about with getting our annual wellness visits on with sick visits is going to apply for the rest of preventive services. Comes right back to here. If we don't get the preventive service on a G2025 claim, we'll have no way to mine the data that it happened without going to each individual note for a patient that received a G2025, and that's just not doable. Remember, our annual wellness visits help drive 
patient attribution. For you population health folks on here, patient attribution is the key name of the game. Annual wellness visit doesn't necessarily win, but plurality of patient services wins. Remember that, that I just showed you back there? Annual wellness visit and the advanced care planning on it? That's how we win patient attribution. It's a whole schematic on how patient attribution wins, but look, I centered it. It's literally at the heart of the process. The red circle there in the center. Did the beneficiary receive the plurality of primary care services from primary care providers participating in the ACO? Yes. And yes, that patient gets attributed. Plurality of services, annual wellness visits, any other preventive screening you can put on there, advanced care planning, tobacco cessation. We can't, of course, put those on if we've done the annual wellness visit. It's another topic. This is a repeat. I just put it on here for emphasis. These type of visits will demonstrate savings to Medicare. Let's say if this patient was in for that office visit and we had him come back, oh, we're going to come back for the rest. You're never going to get him back, my view. But I'm a pessimist and a cynic. So look at the opportunity that we give up if we just do the office visit there. And I've got some incorrect narrative up at the top of there, so just ignore that. Now, we can't talk about annual wellness visits without having the proper HCC coding. And chronic conditions reported in the annual wellness visit are HCC, hierarchical. My kids were getting on me how I pronounce hierarchy. See, I can't say it now. I'm self-conscious about it. Our HCC coding, er, er, uh, tongue-tied, hierarchical <laughs> condition category tells Medicare how sick our patients are. So at the same time we're doing annual wellness visits, we've got to get our patients' chronic conditions reported with these annual wellness visits. And Again, HCC coding is a whole other topic, but here's the example. We're not going to report diabetes and hypertension. We're going to report diabetic hypertension, hypertension caused by diabetes, or however the clinical, you all are nurses, you can fill in the blanks. All of our patients are completely well until the HCC codes are reset annually on the annual wellness visit. The, now it's becoming a little trite. Our diabetic patient that lost a limb grows the limb back every year until we report they've lost their limb on the annual wellness visit. So the annual wellness visit is the opportunity to correctly report the patient's chronic conditions it's the annual wellness visit that represents the face-to-face -face setting for reporting our patient's chronic conditions. This is the yin to the annual wellness visit yang. We're doing the visit. Now we're telling Medicare how sick the patient is and what their conditions are. Critical part. We're talking about annual wellness visits and not talking about HCC reporting. We're not giving a complete picture. And of course, the visit note Capturing this detail is recorded along with patient ID, the date of visit, and a provider signature. Another hint, Medicare does not pay our shared savings based on our claims necessarily. What they do pay on is they're going to send us a list of charts, we're going to have to go then audit the patient's charts to see that all of these things 
we're done. So our claims processes really become a tracking and important critical tracking guide. So don't get me too far when I say yeah, the annual wellness visit claim doesn't matter. It does, it does, it does, it does. That goes into demonstrating the savings that we've performed in annual wellness visit, the whole key. But the other part of that is Medicare is going to get the patient medical record to audit that to see if what we did in the annual wellness visit is documented in the patient chart. And only then does it count for shared savings that the chart matches the claim. The chart needs to match the claim. Look at that annual wellness visit compliance. Yikes. These providers who are fictitious, the numbers are actually real, but I, of course, took any identifying information off. So numbers are real, names fictitious, NPIs, of course, are fictitious. <clears throat> we can see these uh, Randall's patients were pretty sick, 2.4. I can tell you Randall had a lot of nursing home patients. Elizabeth Johnson, doing a little better. Those average HCC risk scores our providers all need to be over one. If we have under one, our patients are healthy in Medicare's views. So our HCC risk scores that come from the HCC diagnostic codes that we put on our annual wellness visits are as important as the annual wellness visit. And that is how they fit together with patient attribution, telling Medicare how sick our patients are, and then Medicare performs their actuarial exercises to determine, based on the services we've provided, how much savings is there. So the annual wellness visit is really, it's the vehicle for all of those things. I'm a sci-fi geek. Just gave 2001 a good rewatch over the holiday season. Probably two or three for 2022. Maybe we'll exceed that for 2023. Gotta change how we think about it. Gotta stop thinking about, okay, which of these encounters are gonna get paid? Stop thinking about that. The priority is that all preventive services are performed and reported along with the clinical visit when we've got the patient there. That's the change in thinking. We've got the patient here, let's get it done. Got a variety of resources out there. Of course, you all know how to contact me. I'm gonna stop the recording.